edition of RCE. Uh, this is Brock Palin. You can follow me at Twitter at uh, B-R-O-C-K-P-A-L-E-N. Uh, I also have with me Jeff Squires. You can find a link to Jeff's blog off of the RCE website at rce-cast.com. Also, there's a nomination form. We love hearing what you guys would like to hear about. Uh, Jeff and I see cover a large basis stuff, but Jeff probably has his own input too about things that are going on in the HPC world. Yeah, it's always nice. I, I actually got uh, twonked by a, a blog reader uh, for a post I made earlier. I got some a bunch of statistics wrong, and uh, he he quite rightfully called me on it. And it took several days of back and forth of email and stuff like that for him to educate me in what the correct way was. And so I had to print a redaction. It was very embarrassing, but at the same time, it's very encouraging to know that people actually are reading it. So that was nice. Always good to keep you honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, who do we have with us today? Well, today we're talking about uh, an interesting topic in the HPC world that a lot of people like to talk about, parallel file systems. And I think we're going to be talking about PVFS and PVFS2. Okay. Our guest is Walt Lingen. Uh, I think I got that right. Well, how about you introduce yourself and correct me if I pronounced your name wrong and tell us about PVFS and what your affiliation is. Okay, um, my name is Walt Ligon, and uh, I'm an associate professor at <clears throat> Clemson University, and uh, one of the original developers of uh, PVFS, the Parallel Virtual File System. Okay, so PVFS has been around for quite some time. It was actually the first parallel file system I ever screwed with. Um, can you tell us a little bit of detail about what a parallel file system is and how PVFS accomplishes it? Sure. Um, a parallel file system is really just a, a file system that's designed to support parallel computing, and that has two uh, aspects to it. One aspect is that what we try to do is distribute the data across many nodes in a parallel computer so that we can use all of the uh, I.O. subsystems of those nodes to get you know faster I.O. So that's one of the big deals is make the I.O. go a lot faster. Uh, then the other aspect is that we have to provide that data to the many tasks of a parallel program. So we support having many tasks uh, accessing the same file concurrently um, in, in doing their data retrieval at a very high rate. Um, so that's basically what a parallel file system is. Uh, PVFS we, was originally designed in 1993 to be uh, the file system for um, something called PVM, which was an early package for doing parallel computing. That's where the name came from. It was a play on PVM. Um, but then uh, after the initial version, uh, my graduate student, Robert Ross, um, rewrote the system, and that's what became known as PVFS-1. Um, then about year 2000, we uh, completely rewrote the system into what is now called PVFS-2, and that's what uh, most people or what everybody who's using PVFS uses today. So what's kind of the big difference between PVFS-1 and 2? You say you rewrote it. I, I assume there was some re-architecting in there. Or were there big uh, functional changes or, or what? Absolutely, it, it was a completely complete rearchitecting. When we wrote PVFS one, we were really trying to sort of understand what goes into making a file system work, and a lot of uh, what we dealt with was how to really build a server that could concurrently handle a large number of requests simultaneously and and do an efficient job of that. Uh, the, our old server. Um, was based on some ideas that we had gotten out of the literature, you know, back then that were based on the idea that the that the network generally was a lot faster than the than the processors ru running in in the net and the disks, and we uh, found that when the ratio of the speed of those various things changed the uh, the the way the file system reacted changed and so we we completely redesigned it so we had a lot more flexibility uh, also in terms of functionality um, the original PVFS allowed any given uh, read or write to access data that is distributed throughout the file in what we call a strided fashion that that's just a complicated word that says uh, I want to read, say, 100 bytes here and then skip 200 bytes and read another 100 bytes and skip another 200 and keep doing that 
pattern for however many iterations. We, we could do that with one small request in PVFS1. Okay, so also in that in that rearchitecture, this is you said it was around 2000 or so. This is kind of when uh, MPI was quite popular and PVM was kind of on the way out the door. D did you guys have any aspirations towards MPIO as part of the new architecture, or or how did that work? Absolutely, uh, PVFS two was designed specifically to be a, a, an MPIO file system. Uh, we. Um, designed it so that the MPI data type became the model for our request type. So when you actually send a request for data to MPI, you could directly send an MPI data type to it. And that's, as far as I know, is the only file system that's ever actually done that. Um, the other thing that happened was that Rob Ross went to Argonne about that time and where MPI, one of the big MPI centers, and so he got involved directly in MPI. So we kind of have been working very closely with them ever since. So PVFS is designed for MPI I.O. Is it designed to handle any other type of I.O. Um, or is it really only meant to take I.O. from some sort of parallel library? Uh, no, actually, you can use PVFS with, with any kind of uh, program. We, the uh, PVFS actually has a – its interface is really not designed for normal programmers. It's something we call a system-level interface and you can then plug it under a whole host of different um, interfaces. This was another part of the re-architecting. So MPI is, that was definitely one of the key ones, but the POSIX interface works quite well with it and uh, we even are currently working on some new interfaces. There's a kernel module to be able to access it. Like you said POSIX interface, so there is a kernel module where you can just mount PVFS like any other, like NFS or Luster or one of these other POSIX file systems? Exactly. Uh, we we have this, um, the kernel module, that allows you to mount it just like any other file system. Uh, there's also a Fuse module that you can mount it under Fuse, and that gives you some more platforms that we didn't used to have. And then we have libraries that can give you uh, direct access. You generally get the best performance out of the, dir the uh, direct libraries, and so that's what you know the serious applications use. But for everyday working with your files, you know people don't want to have to write a special program, and so that's where the kernel modules are really useful. Has anyone written uh, like a database interface where you can make PVFS look like your storage engine for a database? Um, there are some people who have played with that. I don't. I'm not really familiar uh, with the details of it. Uh, we actually have a database under the covers in PVFS, and one of our, our research projects involves uh, exposing that to the user. That's part of one of the new new interfaces I was mentioning. Um, so that you can actually do queries in your file system to locate data other than just navigating through a directory tree like you do normally. So going off in a slightly different direction here, let's talk a little bit about infrastructure here. So uh, you mentioned that parallel file systems are, you're, you're trying to capitalize on the IO subsystem. What does a typical PVFS setup look like? What's, what's the constraints on the system administrator? What, what do they have to set up and things like that? Um, to set up PVFS, you, you designate certain nodes that are going to be servers. Uh, if you have a small cluster, that can be just any node in your system, but usually those are special nodes that people are set aside. They have uh, uh, big disks on them and this sort of thing. Um, you install the, the server process, and you have to install a startup script like you would for most uh, service applications. Um, there's a config file where you primarily list, you know, which systems you're go are going to be your servers and so forth. Um, then there's a library that you're going to install on any node that wants to be a client, which is usually all of your, your other nodes. Uh, if you want to use the kernel module, then you'll install the kernel module on those client nodes as well. And there's a, actually a process that works with the kernel module called the client core, and you have to install that. Um, but most of that, again, we've got you know install scripts that do that, pretty much. And there's a there's a nice little write up that makes it not not too difficult to do. So did you?